15 minutes later. <laughs> My God, what a mess. Well, uh, we talked about the fact that we could have technical problems, right? We are experiencing technical problems. Yay! So it's not 11.45 or 10.45 a.m. yet, but uh, I just wanted to start again speaking so you're not uh, alone by yourselves. Everything's going right. Uh, I don't know what happened. Probably my network was occupied by someone else and now uh, the network is all mine. And I think that probably I had some issues with OBS, the streaming platform, because, I don't know, probably it got threatened because I was talking about killing it from the table of processes or something like that. But still, OBS started really occupying too much of CPU. I stopped the streaming and I realized after a while that the streaming was uh, still in in stopping mode. So I could experience exactly what I was talking about before having everything freezed. I killed OBS. I killed it from the command line because I couldn't kill it from the graphical user interface. I went here, I did exit and it wasn't doing anything. And the only thing that could save me now is either reboot the system or no the terminal. Because with the terminal, I could say kill and the PID of OBS. What is the PID? The PID is the process ID. So if I do top, I can see that OBS has a PID of 27380. So I can do something like um, kill 27830. I don't even remember the name, but I don't want to kill it. And uh, there's an option, dash 9, which is always used to force kill. This is slay with a, with a throwing axe or something like that. Uh, kill forcefully. Or there's also a kill all OBS, which will find any process that is called OBS and will try to kill it. And the same goes with dash 9, which will completely destroy this uh, process that was frozen. So I still have no idea what happened, but uh, I think it could be partially because of the network and partially because of OBS, which is actually, um, um, you know, uh, an unstable program on Linux. It's pretty stable on Windows, maybe even on Mac, but on Linux it's still quite unstable. And uh, I knew it and uh, I wanted to, to try still Nonetheless, um, let me check again the chat. Okay, now I can see you guys. So, um, we still have some uh, timing problems too. The lessons, as every single slide says, the lessons are at 9 a.m. UTC time. 9 a.m. UTC time is a time that I decided to use because it should generate less confusion. And then I got confused myself. <laughs> In fact, last time uh, I didn't take into account uh, daylight savings time. So we used to start at 11 a.m. my time every day. But then when daylight saving time went on, I started at 11 a.m. my time. But some of you said, hey, no, it should be 10 a.m. your time. Oh, you're right. Okay, so last time we started at 11, but we decided last time that from this time we will start at 10 a.m., not... Oh my god, still lagging. Oh, this is bad. This is really, really bad. Okay, so OBS is... Thrashing a lot, in fact. Let me check what happens if I just close the browser. And I'm going to close the... Yeah, now I see your comments. Yeah. Eventually. Yes, I see those comments. I'm sorry. And still not working. 
still lagging like hell, right? I'm afraid that I have to somehow, I don't know, downgrade OBS or something. Let me check. OBS. Uh, a low OBS stream lag. I'm going to use the coding part. How can I fix the stream lag? I'm still looking at your comments if you're... Uh, try to communicate with me but yeah I'm afraid that you are we are not going to to fix this anytime soon why is this lagging no stream attempt in the law no stream at end on scale to 720 okay is there a way I can for example, change the, um, the quality of the stream. Hmm. No idea. I have to do some trials and errors, unfortunately, and uh, it will take some time. But in the meantime, are you confirming that still you're not able to to see me properly um, software okay i don't see any comments from you so probably the stream is still going really really bad Nothing, nothing happening here. So recently I did a couple of things that could uh, probably uh, prevent things from going well. One was using uh, a, a different NVIDIA driver, but I see that it's now using back again the driver that it was using before. I tried to put 455 and now it's still going with 450, which is the previous one. So this is not the problem. So what else can it be? Could it be the version of OBS? Maybe there's this new version of OBS, which is too, you know, too new, too unstable. Let me see something no OBS is purely virtual so nothing's happening here guys are you still not with me right I'm gonna write it here still not with me right yeah hence was I was confused this morning oops <laughs> Yeah, Katri, I can understand. Uh, sorry for that. Uh, it's part of the technical problems that we're experiencing. But right now, I would like to understand if you are able to sort of with you intermittently. Mm. Getting very intermittent audio. Ah, oh, that's really bad. OBS intermittent audio. Okay, intermittent audio uh, glitch that ruins streams recording. PNTM just froze. Update your Windows per blah blah blah. You should at least be on uh, not uh, your GPU is maxed out. Can render scenes. Do you think it's about that the buffer size of this audio device could be causing problems? No, but this is the first time it happens. So why? So many questions with uh, generic answers. Now it's also kind of comping. Oh, jumping. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, okay, so I'm not going to jump myself. 
And I'm pretty sure I cannot solve it right now during the stream. So unfortunately, guys, I'm afraid that we have to interrupt here for today or we can interrupt here for now. I can try to fix the problems and we can try again in a couple of minutes. Uh, that's the only thing that I can think about. Um, not going to find any solution soon apart from probably trying to downgrade OBS. I can try and see what happens. And, um, you know, let's try. I'm going to try to... I'm going to write it on Slack too so you all know about this. Uh, I'm going to try and downgrade OBS and get back to you ASAP. So I'm interrupting the stream right now. Sorry for the inconvenience. Okay, going to interrupt immediately. See you. Don't know if it will last, but seems to be working better than a couple of minutes ago. Seems good now. Okay. Whoa. <laughs> really? And I did nothing at all. But there is lagging. Okay. Uh, probably this is a taboo... Taboo matter that I shouldn't have talked about the killing of processes. Seems more stable now. Okay, okay, let's hope. Let's hope that it kind of works at least for the, the next hour. I don't know. Okay. So we were talking about killing stuff. And uh, I issued this command, tail-f license, which... It looks good now, boss. Okay, thanks a lot, PNTM. So uh, we've got this file that is uh, being read uh, in real time. And uh, it's a running process. And I want to try and kill this process from another tab. So I'm going to open a new terminal on a new tab. I'm going to do top in order to see what open processes are there. And there are many processes now, which so I, I'm not really sure what process is the one that I'm looking for. It's probably one of the lowest ones, which I am not evil, even able to see in this real-time thing. So I'm going to quit with Q. And there's another command that I can issue, which is called PS. PS is a strange command because per se PS gives you almost nothing. And you have to learn by heart some of the options that allow you to see some more of it. For example, one thing that I, one, one piece of command that I usually uh, use, be just because I learned it, not because I know what it does, is PS space AUX, AUX. No idea what this means, but the output is this one. And what is this output? I'm going to issue it again. This is giving me the list of the processes, but not in real time. It's just giving me all the processes that are on right now from the beginning to from, from the start of the computer to right now. So I can see, for example, that there is a Google Chrome open. And this is the user. This is the PID. And uh, I also should be able to see that there is uh, one tail going on. Or a, oh, a cat. There are two cats going on. I don't know why. There's an OBS. And there's a tail. Here it is. Here, this is the command that I want to kill. So this should be the PID of the command. 23196. And I can say kill 23196. So kill that process with that particular process ID, that PID. If I do this, enter, and if everything works well, I can go back to the previous tab and the process was terminated. So as you can see, we can kill processes pretty easily with the terminal. And I'm not going too much in detail on that. Just know that 
what we have here is actually a real programming language in which we can even build some uh, programs. In fact, Bash and the shell languages in general are scripting languages, which means that every command that you issue does something and returns to the, 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 the input to you. And you can write multiple scripts and some uh, system administrators, some DevOps, you actually use this language in order to automate some tasks. For example, with, um, with the shell languages, you can uh, uh, wake up every morning at 8 a.m. playing your, your favorite song. This is something that you can do by writing a script on your command line but it's something that we are not going to do today. So, this is all I wanted to tell you about the command line for now, and I would love to go immediately to the next uh, subject, which is Git. We are going to use the knowledge of our command line in order to understand and to use Git. And I would like to take advantage of the fact that the connection is a little more stable now in order to make it as fast as possible. No, we're going to, 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 to go as slow as it's required. So, what is Git and why? Git is a version control system. And in its purest form, it can be a way for you to do backups of your files and folders without having to do as usually designers do. They create a file called new, then they create a new final, then a new final final, then a new finalist final, then a new finalist final for sure, and finally a new finalist for sure final. Okay, so this is not a good backup system, but we all do this. As soon as we want to, I don't know, experiment with new things on our code, we don't want to experiment on those things while risking to lose all the progress we made so far if we mess up, right? So we usually create a, a backup of that file, a backup folder. Sometimes I do it a lot, actually. Well, I used to do it before using Git. I go to my folder and this was a fix me file so I can create, I copy this file, I create a new file, uh, paste, and I can say this is a fix me backup and this is the fix me that I'm going to fix, right? How many people are using this method, which is fine, it is fine. But maybe sometimes you want something that is a little more reliable and can help you a little more than that. So this is what Git does. It's a special database that we call repository. And it's a database that tracks every single change you want to track. And it stores it, th those changes in a history. Um, and it stores who made the change, uh, when they made the change and also why they made the change because you can even put some text that describes what you did in that change. This is a local backup. This is a local repository. But Git allows you to also synchronize your local backup with some servers on the internet. So your local backup will also be a remote backup. And if you screw anything on your computer, if your computer ta uh, takes on fire, you still have this remote backup in the cloud that you can use in order to get back your code and all the history of your code. So you don't, also, you don't only um, recover the files, you recover the whole history of your work which is pretty cool, because as soon as you mess something up, you can still revert back to some old version of that same file. Or you can do experiments, and you can say, no, I don't like these experiments, let's scrape them and go back to where we started. Or you can do one experiment in one direction with your text, with your code, you can do another experiment on another direction, thus branching to uh, development histories, and then you can merge them together as soon as you decide that those changes that you did 
were cool. So you can try and experiment new things in multiple directions, and then you can merge those changes together and have, again, a playing history uh, ahead of you. So this is what Git gives you. And unfortunately, the drawback is that it's quite difficult f to use. It's not really easy. But it's, it's not difficult because it's... Uh, uh, I don't know, because uh, the commands are difficult. It's because there are some special concepts that you have to understand and visualize. You have to visualize them in your head. There are some graphical tools that will allow us to visualize our, uh, our situation better. But at first, I will go just with a command line. Uh, so we experience a little bit of abstract thinking, okay? So I'm not going to go too much in detail on the basics, etc. But what, what we know already is that you guys have Git installed because we installed it uh, probably on lesson zero, on lesson one at most. So I think that if you do git-v, you should be able to see something, which is not what I wanted. Uh, I should have wrote git-version apparently. And I have a Git, which is version 2.27. Yours could be different, but still, you have Git installed. And this is already a cool thing. And as you can see, Git is a command from the command line. So we're going to use it like that. Is everything fine with Git version? Yay! I'm pretty sure it is. Who knows if lagging is strictly related to the hour of the day? It seems quite strange because, uh, well, it's Saturday morning my time and uh, it's not even lunchtime. How many people are using the internet in Italy on Saturday morning? Aren't they sleeping? I don't know. Anyway, we can start using a couple of commands in order to configure our Git. Um, in order to start even doing our first commit, which I will tell you what this is about, we have to do some global configurations. You have to specify your name and your email in order to identify yourself to Git. And this is done with these commands, git config dash dash global user dot name, and then you place your name possibly in quotes. Uh, otherwise, it will not understand the special space. And uh, so git config dash dash global user dot name and then you, you specify your name. Something like that. It was quite quick and this time with no errors at all. Proud of myself. And I'm not going to do this because I did it already on my system. And I'm not sure if I put my real name or my nickname. And I don't want to change this, um, th this configuration. So I'm not going to do that. Uh, the other command is slightly different. Uh, user.email instead of user.name. And then you put your email. You can put it in double quotes or no. Uh, it's the same thing. Um, you usually use double quotes in order to take care of the spaces. But... Usually, email address do not have spaces, so you don't need those quotes. Remember, however, that you have to put user.email, not user.name. So the command is now changed, git config dash dash global, user.email, and then your email, which can be in quotes or not, it doesn't matter. Once you've uh, created this global configuration, don't worry, you can still change it if you messed up anything. So, really, nothing is uh, lost forever here. You can do something like git config list in order to see all the configurations that you have. git config dash dash list. And I do have some configuration which has user.name, oh, it's my nickname. User.email, it's my email. And then I also have some other configuration that some configurations you could have it, some not, don't worry. This is probably a mix of configurations that come from global configurations, but also some local configurations that I have inside of this folder. If I go somewhere else, 
Yup, the folder tells me completely a different story. So the git config list just gives me a merge of uh, global configurations, which is just the configuration that you two put, and some local configurations for my specific um, repository, because I do have a repository already, but you don't. So let's not care about this. Now I'm in a folder that has no repository at all. Don't go around sharing your email like that. If there are nine gagas in here, you'd probably be registered to some gay porn website really soon. <laughs> really hope not. But that email is not only my personal email, it's my work email. So yeah, I really hope that nobody is going to use that email for bad purposes. But yeah, my email is already spread ac across the globe. If you just go to ingloriouscodes.it, you even have my phone number. So I'm way too open. I shouldn't be that open, but I am. Probably because I believe in the heart of people and in good spam filters. So for now, I want to give trust to the world. Okay, so other commands that we have are git help, which is very similar to the man pages of git. But as you will see, git is so huge that you will probably get lost in, in git. Uh, or you can do git verb help or man git dash verb. Because git is just a command with which you can do lots of things. You start with git and then you say git add or git commit or git merge or git push, etc, etc, etc. You have many commands. It's, just, it's not just git. Git seems like opens the environment in which you issue commands related to git. So we can start creating our own repository, which is a backup, uh, a repository that allows us to create a backup of our own files. And we can do this by initializing the repository locally, or we can have some remote repository on some servers out there, and we can clone that repository, which is probably something that we are going to do later on. For now, I just want to create a new folder and make it and, and create a repository, a backup for that folder. So I'm going to re uh, create a new folder here. How do I create a folder? Make dear make dear and uh, I'm gonna call it my dash project okay so this is a folder that I'm creating that will hold my project I'm pressing enter and I'm CDing inside of my project which means that I'm getting inside of this folder so far so good there's nothing new I created a folder I went inside of this folder and uh, now if I want, I can create new files. For example, I can do touch index.html. Why not? I'm creating a new file without even editing it. I don't care. Okay, so I've got a project folder with a file inside, an empty file. And this is not related to Git. Now I'm going to start using Git. I want to make backups of this folder and of the files contained in this folder. How do I do this? I issue the command git init, which means initialize a git repository, initialize backups inside of this folder. So git space init. If I press enter, I get an output which says initialized empty git repository in home Anthony projects in Glorious Coders Academy my project dot git dot kit dot git seems like a, an, a folder because it has a slash a final slash and uh, it should be a hidden folder because it starts with a dot and as you know on Linux and in the terminal um, anything that starts with a git with a dot is actually a hidden file or folder. In fact, if I do ls, I don't see this folder .git. I must do something like ls-a in order to see the hidden folder, okay? So, we created an empty repository and this empty repository looks like a folder. 
will this folder contain a copy of index.html? No, probably not. This folder is a very special folder, and if I look inside of it, ls-.git, it's already plenty of things. Uh, there's so many things inside which I have no idea what they are. Well, some of them I do, and we don't really care what they are. Um, Git is a repository, and a repository is a special kind of database, uh, database that stores information in a very efficient way. And we don't care how it does it. We just care it, that it does, okay? Nothing more than that. So right now we can even start using a graphical user interface. I'm going to open Visual Studio Code and I'm going to add that folder that we created on the terminal and I'm going to add it here to the workspace of Visual Studio Code. So add folder to workspace. I'm going to look for that folder which is here in my case, my project, and I'm gonna add it so I can see it here. Um, I'll give you some time to find the folder and do the same on Visual Studio Code. If you have any problems, just ask me. I cannot find my folder, where did I put it? Um, but while you're trying to do it, I will give you some pointers. For example, you have this terminal open. If you don't know where you are, just remember you have PWD print working directory or you can just look at the text that is here in the prompt I am in my home directory in the projects folder in glorious coders academy my project yours can be completely different but that's the folder you are in now so if you open visual studio code and add folder to workspace just try to look for the same exact folder that you saw on the terminal and you should be able to find it at a certain point so you add the folder and you see my project with the index.html file here and if you did it i'm gonna remove crash course remove folder from workspace so if you did it you could probably see a different situation from before because the folder and the file look green and there's a u here uh, I don't know if you have exactly the same situation, but you should see something colored, probably. And there's also some notification here on the left. If I click on this notification, I am going into a special section of Visual Studio Code that is the section about Git. Here, Git is listing all the changes that I performed so far, and I can do something with those changes. And I can do this really easily in a graphical way, but before doing this in a graphical way, I would like to do this on, uh, on the terminal and uh, explain a little better what this is about, okay? So, I hope everyone of you has Visual Studio Code up and running and the folder there. I initialized the Git repository and I have a file here which is now in a state called untracked. I'm going to show you on the slides. Here, this is my situation. As you can see, there is a box called untracked. And this when, is when you have a new file that is completely unknown to Git. It's just a new file. If I do git status, I can see what is the status of my repository according to git. I am on a branch called master and I have no commits yet and I do have untracked files. I have this index.html file which looks like it's untracked and if I want it to be tracked I need to use a command called git add file. Um, Babas Coder says I get the response, no such file, after typing cd my project. Okay, okay. So, this... Clear. This error that you have usually is due to the fact that there's actually no such file as my project where you are. For example, in my case, I'm already in the my project folder. So, if I do cd my project, it says pretty much the same thing that it's saying to you. So, 
Babe Ascoder, I would like to ask you, where are you right now? What is the path? Where, what is the output of your PWD? Let's see where you are. And if you want to share this with uh, screenshots, you can do this and share them on Slack. If you're inside of my projects, then that's fine. <laughs> uh, it means that you don't need to do any more CD in my project. You're already where you're supposed to be. So no, no real error here. It's just... Uh, telling you that you are where you are <laughs> okay so you are in documente I'm in documents and what happens if you do ls oh it's fine if you're in documents that's fine but what happens if you do ls are you able to find something like the folder my project So if you were in documents, that's fine. But in documents, you can issue make dear my project, just like we did before. And then we did CD my project to get inside of that folder. And then we did touch index HTML in order to create a new file in that folder. This is what, uh, this is what we had. You get a bunch of names. Yeah, I assume so. Uh, I too have lots of names when I go to my projects folder. So that's, uh, that's quite common. But um, among these folders, you could have created already the my project folder. But if you didn't, you can create it right now. No worries. Let's see. if you can catch up. I'm recapping one last time to make everything clear. We can go to at least index HTML now. Okay, yeah. So, uh, Babas Coder says, I type this, my, make dear my project. And then when you type CD my project, you do not get anything. Okay, you do not get anything, but no errors. So you created a directory called my project, and this just worked. It's not going to work for me because I already have a folder called my project, but that's fine. So you created a folder. Okay, seems good now. Yeah. Uh, no, no, no worries, no worries. Uh, just remember, once you are in my project, you can also touch index.html because this way you can create this new file and of course you have also to git in it inside of that folder let me get inside of that folder and you have to do git in it in order to initialize this empty git repository once you initialize this empty git repository on visual studio code you will see something different because this is not only a folder with a file. It's a green folder with a green file. Catry Food says, I'm inside the My Project folder on Terminal. Perfect, yes. This is where you're supposed to, to be. You are inside of My Project, of My Project folder in the Terminal. If you do an ls, you should find the index.html. And if you don't, you can just create it by issuing this command, touch index.html. And you also need to initialize a Git repository if you haven't already, which is git init. This initializes this Git repository. Hope that everything is clear. Don't lose any of these commands, otherwise nothing will work for the rest. Once you did all this, you can do a git status in order to check the status of your project. And what I see is something that probably is not completely understood right now, but we are on a branch called master. And we don't know what this is, but don't worry. We have no commits yet, whatever a commit is. <laughs> and we have some untracked files. We have an index.html file. And if I want to track it, I, ha I need to issue this command, git add file or files to include in what will be committed. 
Okay, so uh, Rachel says it worked. Catchy foot too. Babus Coder has still some problems. Did that, but nothing changed in my Visual Studio. And Beba says, git status on branch master, no commit yet, untracked files, index, nothing added to commit, but untracked file present. You know what, Ricardo? I think you have exactly the same situation as mine. So this is good. Now, what do you have on Visual Studio Code? On Visual Studio Code, I added that same folder that you just created on the, in the workspace. You have to do also that extra step. So try to look for that folder. I have it personally in Anthony Projects in Glorious Coders Academy, my project. You probably have it in your users, Ricardo, documents, and then my project. You should find it. Yeah, yeah, it's there. Um, so you add it and you should find it on Visual Studio Code. You just lost uh, some of the commands. Am I going too fast? I can slow down. Okay, I think you should be able to now add this project to the to the workspace. And if everything goes well, you should see it's greenish or colored because this folder, Visual Studio Code is giving us extra information. It's just not just a project uh, folder with a file. It also has some information about Git. And uh, how shall I add it in Visual Studio? Hmm. Okay, right click here in the workspace. You right click, add folder to workspace. We did it already last time. Add folder to workspace. And then you look for your project and then you edit. Very similar to any other editor out there. Mine listed a lot of files with git status thing. Okay, Katri, if you see lots of things, you probably added the wrong files and we could be in a slight mess here. So pre please, Katri, tell me where you are right now what is the output of your pwd let's see what is the output of uh, catri's pwd this is the first time in which we are going to have problem in which we are experience problems and it's completely normal because so far we did very simple things and we were allowed to make mistakes. The mistakes were not that important. But now we're going to get in the real meat of programming in which you cannot skip a command or you cannot skip a well-performed command. Otherwise, you will completely do something else. You are going to ask the machine to do what you ask, but not what you want. So, Babes Coder says, still get this error message when typing git status. Well, this is not an error message. In fact, it's the same message that I see here, and it's not an error. It's actually good information, okay? Ketri says, no, it looks the same as yours, but with lots of files instead in red. And that's strange. It shouldn't be lots of files. If you created a folder called my project with just an index HTML, and uh, no, it shouldn't be that many files. If there are so many files, it probably means that you are looking at a different Git repository. And I don't want you to mess everything up right now. So it's important that you just see one untracked file. Okay, Katri shared me an image. And here's the image. Yep, there's so many things. And if I if I can make an educated guess, what I see here. Yep, I see it. Uh, what I see here is actually that you have somehow turned your home folder, the whole home folder, into a Git repository. This is one of the 
little messes that we can do if we don't pay attention. I'll show you what kind of uh, error can lead you to this problem, okay? So if I go to my home, here's my home. I create the, my project folder. And then before CDing into my project, before getting inside of that uh, folder, I'm doing git init. If I do this, what I'm doing is I'm creating a git repository for the whole home folder. And the home folder contains all your documents, all your pictures, all your files, but it also contains lots of hidden files if, that I can show if I do ls-a. Look how many hidden files I have here. Some of the f these files, I saw them in, uh, in, your, uh, um, in, in your screenshot too. And uh, Rachel says, eek, I just had my desktop folder by mistake. Oops, no worries, no worries. You didn't lose anything at all. But now you have to be extra careful Wherever you are, in your desktop or in your home, you can just remove that .kit folder that you have. So, don't do it with me right now. If I were you, I would do rm-r, so remove recursively, the .git folder. No space, .git. And this will remove the git folder, thus reverting the state of your folder, which is not a Git repository anymore. If you're unsure of this, don't worry, don't do this. Especially if you were on Windows, you can do the same thing on your, uh, um, on your file manager. So you go to your home folder, you go to your desktop folder, you locate the .kit folder, you should be able to see it, you select it, you remove it from there. And this will move it to the trash bin without uh, the risk of uh, removing important files. I don't want you guys to now send a remove command and wipe out every one of your documents. So don't, don't move it. Don't move the git folder. You just remove it completely and we go back to normal. So if I am on my home page or if I am on my desktop folder, which is actually quite empty in my case. Yeah, my desktop folder is empty, but maybe you did git init inside of here. Oh no, I created an empty repository here. How do I do this? I skipped the part with registering the username and email, but still worse. Can I do it later on? Yes, you can do it later on. Uh, that will give you problems only when you commit your first file. So it's better if you start doing it right now. <laughs> because otherwise you will get an error and uh, you're still on time. You can do git config dash dash global user.name and your username and then git config dash dash global user.email and then your email. You do this wherever you are, since it's a global configuration, you don't need to, to be in a specific place. So just issue those two commands. While you are issuing those two commands, how do I remove it, says Katri. Okay, I git initted in the, in the wrong path. So I can do ls-a and I see that it's there. That we have a folder that we don't want to have. So, if I'm an expert user, I can use the terminal. I can do rm-r.git. But this, if you type it incorrectly, you could remove some important files that you have in this folder. So if you're unsure of this command and you don't want to risk it, you can do this with a graphical user interface. You can go, you can open your file manager on Windows, Linux, Mac, whatever. You go to the folder that has problems. In my case, it's the desktop. You should be able to visualize the hidden files already. I don't. So I'm going to do a control H in order to visualize those files. I see this um, hidden file and I can just delete the file by pressing delete. Eek, how do I get out of the my project folder? 
On the terminal, if you want to get out of your project folder, you just do a cd dot dot in order to get outside of this folder to your parent folder. As you can see, it's really, really important, guys, that you practice on these commands because if you know how to use these commands, then you are able to solve your problems with Git. If you're not able to use these commands easily, then you are adding up this as a problem to the Git problems that we already have. So every problem that we face at each lesson is, will become the solution to the next problems that we face. Or if you're not practicing enough, it will accumulate as a problem to every other problems that we had so far. Catrifoot says it only comes with index.html. Yes, the My Project folder should have only the index.html and probably, if you did things correctly, also this hidden Git folder. But if you didn't do this correctly, don't worry, we're still in time to recover. So no panic at all, no worries. Everybody now has a different situation and it's normal because it's the first time. So don't worry. For the most part, those who got things non-correctly, it means that you issued the command git init in the wrong place. For example, in the desktop. Now, you didn't mess up bad. You just created a folder called git. Now I've done rm-r.git. Has it removed it? Who knows? Let's see. Let's see. If I do ls-a on this folder, I see .git, so I didn't remove it. But now I'm going to do rm-r.git, and then when I enter this command, did I remove it? I don't know. Let's do ls-a again. And yes, I don't see the folder .git anymore. So yeah, this command removed the git folder, which means that this folder is not a repository anymore. It's just a folder. Okay, so this is how you recover things. You init wrongly in the wrong place. You just remove the folder and you're back to business. Now, I'm going back to the folder called my project, which was inside of uh, home folder, projects, in Glorious Coders, um, Academy, and it should be here. Yeah, it's my project. So some of you could have created the Git repository here. You did Git in it in here. That's fine. You messed up, but you can still do a rm-r.git and recover from your error. Now, how do you get back to your project folder? If you practice, you'll know that there are so many ways you can go back to your project folder. You can use relative paths or absolute paths. I, used, I just used an absolute path because I said, go to my home folder and from there you can go to projects in Glorious Coders Academy. Or if you know where you are, for example, if you know that you are in the Academy folder and you have to go just one folder, uh, one step further, I c you can do CD into my project. And now I'm in the my project folder. Okay, so you have to practice a little bit on how to reach certain folders, how to get out of those folders. Uh, please, for next week, do some practice on this. Uh, it's fun. I, I can assure you it's not that difficult and uh, it's really, really important. Um, okay, so some of you instead CD'd into my project and issued the command git init, which is correct. You should have done git init. Yes, just cd my project, exactly. Yeah, this is how you, it seemed to work, nice. So you were in the parent folder and now you're inside of the my project folder, nice. So now you can do a git init if you haven't already. If you have already, it's going to tell you, hey, I reinitialized an existing git repository. And that's fine, because we haven't done anything yet. So that's fine. Okay, so we have this folder with a file inside, but actually it's not just one file. It's one file and a hidden .git folder inside, which is the git repository, okay? And if we open it on Visual Studio Code, we can see everything is green. 
And if we do git status inside of this project, you should see this kind of output, which is not an error. It's giving you the status of your git repository. We are on branch master, we have no commits yet, we have one untracked file, which is index.html. Nothing added to commit, but untracked files present. Use git add to track. It's giving you some uh, information of what to do next. Is everything right so far? Let me see if there are any other screenshots going on. No, everything is cool. Okay. So, okay, if everyone has the same situation, we can start doing our first backup. How does Git work in this sense? Uh, I hope that everybody did the git config global um, commands because right now, if you didn't do it, it will say, hey, you first need to issue these two commands. But don't worry for that. It's not a huge problem. You just issue those commands and then the problem will be solved. We have one file which is in a state called untracked, which means that this file is there, it's present, it's unknown to git, so it's not even backed up. And we want to back it up. We want to save a copy of that file so we can start changing it and revert back to the old copy or maybe just uh, continue working on it. This is what Git does. Haha. <laughs> okay. Uh, so we are in an untracked file. And uh, what Git does, and it's kind of different uh, respect to other version control system, you have to cherry pick all the files that you want to put in the backup. And cherry picking those files is adding those files to the staging area. The staging area is a special place where you prepare your first commit, your first backup. So the staging area is just a, you know, a plate in which you put all the files that you want to back up. The files that you don't want to back up, you don't put them in that plate. You just leave them outside. This is an extra step that some, usually it's not needed by other version control systems, but here it's uh, pretty important. We have to stage these files. We only have one file here, which is called index.html. And now we can add it to the staging area by issuing the command git add index.html. What does it mean to add? I'm not adding it anywhere. I'm adding it to the staging area, to this plate in which I'm preparing, I'm, you know, packing the next backup. If I do git add index.html and press enter, nothing seems to be changed. But instead, something did change. And I can check it with git status again. Okay. The output is now a little different. We are on branch master, as always. We have no commits yet, okay. But now, instead of having untracked files in red, we have one new file in, sorry, in green that is in the staging area. In fact, I can even issue a command to unstage this file back, to remove it from the plate, okay. So this is the list of all the changes that will be committed, that will be backed up by Git. Graphically, I can go to Visual Studio Code and I can see that something changed. Uh, I was here in the file system, but I can click on this notification, which is the Git uh, source control section. And I can see that index.html, which was inside of the changes before, is now in the staged changes. So this is the list that contains all the files that will be ready to be backed up, to be committed. Okay? And uh, now I can just show you the graphical version of staging and unstaging. If you want to stage files, you have to do git add and the name of the file. And if you want to unstage, it seems that you have to use git rm dash dash cached file. And I can try git rm dash dash cached, whatever it means, and then the name of the file, which is index.html. 
OK, something happened. If I do a git status, I see again the same output that I had before staging the file. And on Visual Studio Code, this is what I have. I have a list of changes, and in the changes, I see the index.html changed. And when I hover on this file, I see some buttons appear, right? These buttons allow me to do multiple things. One of them is the plus button, and if I click this plus button, it's going to stage my change, which, will means, which means that it's going to add it in the staging area. So I'm clicking on this button, and now this file is now listed in the staged changes. So you can understand that the minus and the plus buttons here are exactly the same thing as issuing the commands git add and git rm on the terminal. Of course, it's uh, much more convenient to click on buttons here, but the cool thing about um, the terminal per se is that it allows you to be very productive, very powerful. You can sometimes issue commands that you cannot do in the graphical user interfaces. For example, you can kill processes, unresponsive processes. You can kill demons on the terminal. And there's another cool thing. If you can do one thing on the terminal, then you can automate that thing. You can make the machine do it for you. A machine is not really keen to click on buttons but a machine is able to issue commands on the terminal. So whenever you are able to do something on the terminal, that is something that uh, you can then automate, you can schedule, you can program. And this is what makes it really, really powerful. Usually a user interface is fine. And I use user interfaces every day, but sometimes the terminal allows you to be much more powerful and sometimes to skip, avoid work, because you can leave it to someone else. Okay, so now we know how to stage and unstage files, which means adding them in the staging area, which is a special place where we are preparing our commit. Why do we need this? Well, let's go back to the Explorer uh, section. I can create another file here, and I'm going to call it style.css. And now you can see the difference between staged files and unstaged files. I can go back to the source control explorer and you can see that the index is staged. The style CSS is not staged. It's still in the untracked, uh, unstaged section. So here we are cherry picking which files, which changes we want to back up, we want to commit. And in this situation here, we have the index.html, which will be backed up, which will be committed, but the style CSS will not be backed up unless I stage the file. Now, both they are in the staged area, but I can remove, add and remove from the staging area. I know it sounds pedantic and it usually is. I confess that most of the time when I do changes on my code, then I add everything and there is a special button that allows me to stage everything and I commit everything all at once. Purists of Git say, no, you should never do that because you have to decide file by file which files you want to put in, uh, in, the, um, in, the, in the next backup. But still, the way I work, I usually work on one specific feature that involves multiple files and as soon as I uh, completed that feature, I just back, back all the files uh, in, in, in the same commit. Uh, Catry Food says, my file has a U, git rm cached index html. So, two objections from Catry. First objection, my file has a U. Well, mine has two, so don't worry. <laughs> Um, yes, the style CSS has a U because probably it means that it's untracked. It's still a new file that has no, um, no correspondence on Git. So it's not even uh, used by Git. Well, A means that it's been added by Git to the staging area. So this, this convention is pretty coherent with uh, the, the situation that we have right now. 
Um, PNTM says, I think I missed a step on how the style CSS was added. Yeah, I went really, really fast on that. I'm sorry. I just right clicked on the project and I created a new file and I named it style CSS. I did it really, really quickly and you can do the same. So yeah, you can create the file from Visual Studio Code or if you want, you can just touch style CSS and you can create the file. Or if you remember what touch does, since the file was already there, I just touched it. So I just updated its timestamp. Yeah, you can create the file as you wish. Catchy Food says, no, no, the index HTML has a U, it's not, it has not an A. Okay, um, I don't know where you are right now, but if you did a git rm dash dash cached index HTML, this means that the file index HTML was in the staging area, so it had an A, but after this, you removed it from the staging area, so the file is back in an untracked state, which is actually seen as a U. So in order to visualize better, look at this diagram. We have an untracked file. We add the file to the staging area, so it becomes staged. But if we remove the file from the staging area, it turns back into the untracked state, okay? We, we just went back and forth between being untracked and being ready to be committed, added to the staging area. But how do we make it A? Okay, how do we make it A? A means added, added in the staging area. So in order to make it A, we need to add it back again to the staging area. And how do we do that? We use a command called git add, index HTML, or we can go to Visual Studio Code and make it visually by just pressing the plus symbol on the index. The index now is A, is added to the staging area. Jabata says, what's the point in registering the email on Git? Would I receive anything? Otherwise, I'm up to speed, was just wondering. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. No, you don't need to register the email to receive any spam or anything. In fact, we're not even communicating to any remote server right now. The email is just a unique identifier for the user. So uh, it's just your personal account. You put any name you want, and that name can be really anything you want. It can even be uh, the same name as mine, although I wouldn't recommend it, of course. But the email serves as a unique identifier that will ultimately identify you uh, and tell the difference between you and me. So, no, it's just a, yeah, it's just a unique identifier. Katri says, how do we add the index HTML to the staging area? As I did the RM cache thing. Okay, I thought I just said it, but I, I don't know if there are any problems with the stream. So I'm going to say it again. Uh, you can issue the command git add index.html. This will add the file again to the staging area because this is the command that adds to the staging area. Or you can do it visually by just clicking in the source control panel on the plus symbol. If you do plus, then the file is added to the staging area. In fact, it has an A. If you click on minus, it's exactly the same thing as doing a git rm cached, whatever it means, of style blah blah blah. Could you explain again what the stage category is relevant for? Yes, of course, yes. It's actually pretty strange and abstract. It's something that other source control uh, systems do not even have for real. But Git, sometimes it's really, really pedantic. And before performing a backup of my files, I need to specify which files I want to backup. So this is... <laughs> Okay, Katri caught up. Nice. So we need to uh, do this extra step of cherry picking, of choosing the files that we want to back up, to, that we want to commit. For example, right now we've got 
two files, which are the index and the style CSS. And I want to decide that the index should be backed up, but the style should not be back up, backed up yet. I still want to continue working on it. And it will be backed up later in a, in a, in a subsequent commit. So this is what the staging area does. It allows me to place on, on a plate which files I want to prepare for the commit and which files I don't want to prepare for the commit. In my special case, I care so little about cherry picking the files that usually before every single commit I do, I do git add dot, which means add to the staging area this folder and all of its contents. This is a shortcut that allows me to put everything single file that I have in the staging area ready to be backed up with a commit. And it's the same exact thing as pressing this button here. Because if I have on track changes, I can tr stage all the changes together with the press of one button. Click, boom. I'm not sure you see all the comments. Yes, Katri, I think I see them all. So yeah, you cut up, that's fine. That's good. Okay, so staging area is pretty strange, but it's just a place where you can decide if you want to commit everything or if you just want to commit one part of the files, okay? And finally, we can perform a commit, so we can do a backup. Right now, I staged everything, but uh, if I want, I can decide to stage only index.html and not style CSS. So graphically, I pressed on a minus and I have index.html staged and style CSS unstaged. On the terminal, I can do git status and this reflects exactly what I know. There is one file which is staged to be commit, it's in the index.html, and one files, one file which is actually untracked. It's not in the staging area, it's style CSS. Now I want to commit. Commit means create uh, a backup point. And it's pretty easy actually. You just say git commit, but a commit will be possible only if I add a comment, if I describe my commit, if I describe what I am backing up and uh, what the code so far does, something like that. In order to add a comment, I can do multiple things. One thing that I can do is I can add this comment inline by using this option, dash M, and then in quotes, I can write whatever I want. For example, initial commit, which is a pretty standard commit as a, a commit message as a first commit. So if you want, you can issue the command like this, git commit dash M, and then in quotes, you write whatever you want. The comment that you add to the commit must not be just one string. It can be a huge paper instead. It can have a title, it can have a body, it can be describing lots of stuff. I like to keep my comments pretty short because I do lots of commits, so I don't want to waste too much time every time writing stuff. So my comments are usually pretty short, but if you want, you can make longer, longer commits, the commit messages. Uh, it's not really convenient to do this like this in line. So if you want, you can do another thing. You can do a git commit, press enter, and git will open the default editor that you have on your system. And in this case, it's nano. I don't know if you opened Vim, but in my case, luckily, it's Nano. So at least I know how to exit. Nano is a text editor, so I can uh, write whatever I want. Initial commit. And then I can save whatever I wrote with Control O and press Enter. And then exit from here with Control X, just like in Nano. So git commit 
is a command that if I don't specify the M option, the message option, will automatically open the default editor and will allow me to specify the comment, the message, uh, with a more advanced editor, so I can write a, a, a title, a body, and whatever I want. Or if I want to make it things quicker, I can just commit in one line like this. But I already done this commit, so I cannot do this anymore. Once I quit the editor, the commit will be performed. In fact, I see some things happening here, and it says on branch master, this is the root commit, this is the ID of the commit. This is the text of the commit. One file was changed, which is the index.html. Uh, no text insertions, no text deletions. And I created the index.html um, on the git repository. And that's it. What, if, what happens if I do git status? Git status says, that I'm on branch master. I still have one untracked file, which is the style CSS, but it's now not telling me anything about the index.html anymore. Rachel says, Mac doesn't tell me what editor it is, but what do I do once I type in initial commit? Okay, so you typed in initial commit, and we must understand what kind of editor this is. So. Does the editor have this kind of menu here on the bottom? Because if it has, you're probably using Nano right now. So let me know if you see this menu on the bottom. If it is, then you can save with uh, Control O and press enter to confirm. And my default editor is Vim, PNTM says. How can I change this to Nano? I don't want to be stuck in Vim for two years. And Tivere says no menu. Okay, so I think you both have pretty much the same problem. Uh, I think you both have Vim, which is uh, not, that, uh, not that of a problem. So first of all, let's try to quit Vim. Don't worry, if you manage to write initial commit, that's already a good achievement, I don't know how you did, you can probably, if you're in Vim, you can probably press column and then Q and press enter in order to exit Vim. Oh, joking, PNTM, I got out, but still curious on changing the default editor. Yes, that's a curious uh, question that I'm going to answer immediately. But I would like to help to Rachel before... Well, I'm waiting for Rachel to give me any feedback on her situation. In the meantime, I can say, I can ask Google, change default editor git. How do I change the default editor? There's a setting on git configuration which is actually talking about the same, um, the same configuration that we already mentioned a while ago. And I'm pretty sure that we... Oh, here it is. git config dash dash global core.editor and then he says emacs, which is one of the editors that we have. Um, I don't remember. Does Mac have Nano installed? Because if it has, you can just type git config dash dash global core.editor nano. Or if you want to use any other editor, even a graphical editor, you can even use Visual Studio Code. And the command to open Visual Studio Code is code. <laughs> so pretty basic. So if you want, you can type git config dash dash global core.editor code. I don't have a menu visible, uh, it's Rachel. I'm sorry, I probably mispronounced your name. Uh, is it Rachel? I, I, I hope it's right. Um, yeah, I don't have a menu visible, says Rachel, and, uh, and PNTM says, probably you got Vim as default. I think so too. Uh, if you're both on Mac, I will probably try to help you 
with my own Mac, hoping that it will not uh, make my stream lag just as it did before. But I have to do this extra try. Oh, no, no, you were right, okay. Okay, so the Mac is uh, turning on. Hopefully it will not freeze my stream. Really hope so. And I also really hope that the Mac is not trying to now update itself or do strange things. Okay, so it's Rachel. Nice. Just like uh, from friends. On Windows with the Without the dash M, it directly opens Visual Studio Code. Okay. Rani, it says, you can change the default editor with command git config global core editor nano. Yes, that's it. That's true. Uh, this is what we found too. And uh, I'm going to do the same here, however. Oh, this is a very nice <laughs> editor. Uh, there was a way to make it bigger. And I'm going to use it. Okay. So this is my this is my terminal on Mac. I I think I have Git installed here. I think I do. It's just taking too long. Way too long. Okay, yeah. Uh, unknown option because I never remember how to type this uh, option uh, git version but i now i have it so i can do the same things that we did together so far i can create the my project here i can cd into my project here and from the project directory i can git in it and now i initialize an empty git repository then I can touch a new file such as index.html and I can add this file to the staging area just by adding the file itself or just adding whatever contents of this folder. Now I can try to commit this file and I can do it without the dash m option but it opens some strange editor that I don't know what it is. Well, it is probably vim. In fact, I'm trying to type things, but I cannot because I'm not in the uh, edit mode. So I don't want Vim. I want to quit. So I'm going to um, ask somehow. Now I'm in a special... Okay. I'm going to do column, quit with an exclamation mark in order to forcefully quit without even keeping any of the changes that I, that I performed. And now I know it was Vim, and I don't want to be in Vim. PNTM says, I already changed my default editor. Thanks for the input. Damn teaching Vim. I got late here. <laughs> don't worry. Um, I will give you uh, a game that you can perform online in order to learn Vim by yourself. And uh, we can play together. So we don't want Vim because... Vim is powerful, is really cool, but we just want simple stuff. So we found out that we can specify this configuration here, which is git config dash dash global core dot editor. Was it editor? Yeah. So, so. Space, and we can specify whichever editor we want. For example, nano. If I do this and I try to commit again, oh, this is nano. And I know how to use Nano. I can easily quit with Control X. And he's aborting commit due to the empty commit message. But I can try again, git commit. I'm going to say initial commit. I'm not even sure I need to save this file. I can just quit with Control X. No, I probably need to. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah let's save it. So, Control O, press enter to save press X to, to, to exit, and now I'm seeing the same error uh, that I was talking about if you don't specify the git config global username and user email. So, as you can see, I have some issues here that are not really, really important, 
but I don't really care about right now, so I'm gonna close this and uh, forget about it. But still, since you already done the Git config global username and user email, you don't see these issues and the world is a better place now. So I'm gonna remove everything uh, that I created so far on Mac and going to close Mac. Shut down this Mac. Going back to Linux. Um, Artia Hiko. Yes, uh, we, we went to Nano. We are not going to use Vim. If you're curious about Vim, then why not? Let's go see a little bit about Vim later on. Uh, maybe for those who, of you who are interested. One thing that I can um, suggest you, if you like games and you want to learn Gim, uh, you want to learn Vim, is to go to vim-adventures.com, which is a pretty cool game that allows you to learn to learn Vim by playing a RPG. Okay, so when I'm typing git commit, says Angelo, and hit enter, it doesn't open a text editor, but just shows the same output as the git status command. Hmm, okay, this is really, really strange. So you said git commit, and you see this, right? This is the problem that you see. So it's not a problem. It's, fa it's the fact that you, you put some files in the staging area ready to commit. Then you committed those files by issuing git commit the first time. So now the staging area is empty once again. If I look at Visual Studio Code, I see some changes. I see the style CSS being changed but untracked, it's not in the staging area, so there's nothing to commit. This is the problem. This is what it's saying here. Nothing was added to commit, but there are some untracked files present. So if you want to perform another commit, you have to put those files back in the staging area and commit them with a second git commit command. Um, Art Yahiko says, although how much can you do with Vim? You can do everything you like. You can do... You can program, you can uh, use Vim as a full text and programming editor uh, with integration to Git. You can do so many things. Why, sorry? Oh, with Nano. No, okay. With Nano, you cannot do as much as you can do with Vim. Vim Nano is much less powerful, but it's a very quick and dirty editor that you can use to uh, write things and uh, save and quit. There's not much you can do here. You can uh, cut lines, paste lines. You, there's a, also a command to justify the text, which I never did. Uh, you can undo and redo changes. And if you open some uh, code with Nano, there's also some um, syntax highlighting there. I'm gonna show you Nano solve by cheating. You can see there is some syntax coloring. Not that much, but there is some. <coughs> Plugins in Nano? Mm, maybe there are, but Nano is not famous to be uh, a plugin-based editor. So I'm not really sure. There are so many plugins for Vim, but I'm not really sure about uh, plugins for Nano. Um, I. I wouldn't use Nano as my text editor for programming, but if I have to quickly change some configuration files, then that's good. Or git messages. Well, Vim has lots of plugins. In fact, if you start uh, getting inside of the world of Vim, you will never get out of it because there are so many plugins, so many configuration... Why the lambs? Uh, so many configurations. Why do you use Vim? You wouldn't get it. Well, gedit is another editor that we have on Linux. That's a clever pun. But yeah, Vim can uh, look like uh, not even a text editor. It can have lots of uh, very complex thing and it can really help you write code in a effective way. As for me, I prefer a graphical editor such as Visual Studio Code. So configuring Nano isn't popular for, so what do you use for programming code editor? I use Visual Studio Code. 
I was fond of other editors such as Atom from GitHub, but then GitHub was bought by Visual Studio Code, uh, by Microsoft, I'm sorry, and uh, the competitor Visual Studio Code started pretty soon to be more performant, more powerful, more followed by the community. So right now I'm mainly using Visual Studio Code, graphical editor, very reliable, very well done. Okay, so we created our first commit, and uh, if I do git commit again, oh, I'm in the wrong folder, sorry, I'm going back to the folder where I was before, um, which should be here, yep. So if I do git commit again, there's nothing to commit, because before committing anything, I still need to put the files into the staging area. If I put files in the staging area, for example, git add style CSS, I messed up with the chat. If I git add style CSS, it means that I'm putting this file in the staging area ready to be committed. So now, if I do git commit, it will perform a commit because there is something to commit in the staging area. Uh, if I do git status, I see that there is a file ready to be committed in the staging area. So I can git commit, too many M's, git commit, it will open nano, hopefully, and I can say my second commit, and I save with control O and enter, and I exit with control X. And now I have another commit. Now I have two backups. I have one backup which contains only the index.html and I have a second backup which corresponds to the situation that I have right now which is having both files, index.html and style CSS. This is the history of my commits. There's no any more changes here to do, to perform and my files are all white. There's no U there's no green color because what I have here in my working directory is exactly the same thing that is backed up in the repository. There is another important command that I can use in order to see the history of my backups. And this command is git log. If I press git log, I see a couple of information. What I see here is a tree. It doesn't look like a tree, but trust me, it is a tree. This is the root of the tree. This first uh, five lines is the unique identifier of my first commit, which is pretty much the same as my first backup. The author is Ice on Fire, which has an email of antonymistretta at gmail.com, which are exactly the configurations that we put with uh, git config global. This is the date of my commit, and after one line, this is the text, this is the message of my commit. So imagine this as the root node of a tree that is going to expand vertically um, upwards. This second block is, in fact, another node that sits on top of my root commit. So now we have two nodes, one at the bottom and one on the top. This is my second commit. It has a completely different ID, auto-generated, I don't care about it. The author is the same. The date is a few minutes later. And this is the text, the message of my second commit. If I want to see it a little more like a tree, I can specify uh, some uh, options to this git log command. I usually use something like one line because one line presents the log in just one line per commit, which is a little uh, uh, easier to read. There's not, enough, not many information, but it's enough information. There's the ID, which is not exactly the same ID I have here, but it's the four, uh, the first, how many are there? Seven characters of the ID, which is sufficient. Uh, it's sufficient to uniquely identify that commit. And then I've got just the message. So ID, 
and message. And here I've got ID, message, and also a couple of things that I haven't explained yet. But this, there is a word that is recurring, master. This is a strange word because we always use this word master. But you know how it goes with uh, people getting offended for lots of things. Uh, well, at a certain point, GitHub and uh, also Git and uh, I think Microsoft itself decided to get rid of this word called master and uh, to replace it with something else. I think it will be called main. Um, I thought that instead of calling it main, it should have been called trunk as in other version control systems because we're talking about trees with branches and well, trunk is the main branch. So I like the term trunk and I'm not offended by the term master. I hope it doesn't offend you guys. It's not master and slave. Uh, there are no slaves here. Uh, yes, we have in, uh, in computer science the concept of master and slave. But of course, it's related to machines. There is a machine that is a master and other machines that are slaves. But we also have other things. We slay demons and uh, uh, we have servers and clients. Uh, it's just, um, you know, metaphors. And in this case, I'm not even I don't even think that master is put in, uh, in comparison with, a, with some slave. Because there are, there's no such concept as a slave on Git. So I think that this is more like a master student, like Master Chifu from Kung Fu Panda. So... I don't think that we should call Master Chifu main Chifu or trunk Chifu. It can still be master. But anyway, okay, so we've got these head master that we don't know what they are. And uh, let's just skip them for now. Git log one line is giving me the log, the history of my commits, one line per commit, which is a little more easier easier to read, especially if you have lots of commits. And there's another option that we can use, which is graph, which adds just a, an asterisk here. Um, it's not really that fancy, but once we start using Git a lot more, uh, this will not just be asterisks, you will see lines, colored lines, because as you probably imagine, Git's, Git allows you to create very complex histories. And you can see a glance of a complex history in this image here. So these nodes that you can see here are all commits in a main history, which is this blue one. But then this tree that started from the bottom and is uh, slowly rising up with every commit ha is now branching. We have branches, we have other flows of development. And these flows of developments, as you can see, go one commit further or multiple commits further, and then they just uh, stay there. Or they can merge back together in the main trunk in the main branch of, uh, of this history. So we can have lots of uh, different situations and this is already a, a complex situation, but not that complex. There are so many hugely complex scenarios. And what git log one graph, one line graph does is visualize everything in some sort of uh, uh, text base user interface. But luckily there are some uh, uh, user interfaces that are more graphical. So now I don't remember if uh, I had to put... Yeah, I've got... Um, I, I think I've got one extension related to Git, which I can now disable for now. And I need to reload the editor. I'm disabling anything that can get into your uh, into your way. Okay, I think we've, we're done. So, you know that Visual Studio Code has lots of uh, options and things that you can do. Visual Studio Code is part of uh, 
a family of editors that allow you to quickly get to any functionality by just pressing um, a combination of keys. This combination is Control Shift P or Command Shift P if you're on Mac. This opens the so-called command palette. And this command palette allows you to start typing what you want and you will probably find uh, an option in the menu that is exactly what you want. For example, if I say git log, nope, I can find anything. Git history, I cannot find anything. Okay, so, <laughs> and I pressed S in order to close the command palette. G the git log apparently is not available by default on Visual Studio Code, which is kind of strange. Atom used to have a git log, but still, you can add extensions to Visual Studio Code by going to the extensions panel. And I happen to find an extension called Git History. So I already installed it, and if you want to install it, you can do it. Just, just search the extension Git History and you find the extension, you install it with just a click of a button. I don't know if you need to um, re reload the, the editor or not, but once you installed it, we're good to go. We can go back to our code, do Control shift p to open the command palette, and if I ask for git log, now I can find something. git view history, which is perform a git log. I click on this, ooh, okay, this is a little better looking than the git lock that I saw in the, on the terminal. I can still see the same things, I can still see one initial node here, which is initial commit performed by ice on fire on 11, uh, 7th of November 2020, this American date format, I still cannot get the hang of it, at uh, 12.55.30 p.m. This is the ID of the commit, and there are some, uh, some things that I can do with that commit. And then I can go to my second commit, which is on top of the initial commit, with its specific ID, etc., etc. And I still see this master thing going on. I see it here. I even see here on the bottom left, this master is quite important as a concept, whatever the name is. One day it will not be master anymore, it will be main or trunk or root or whatever. It's still important as a concept itself. Okay, so this is my history. And if I click on one of these commits, I can have details of what happened. And in a very strange graphical interface, I'm seeing that well, in this second commit, only one thing happened. I added one file called style.css. Well, in the initial commit, the history says that I added one file, which was index.html. I can view the file, view the file content, which is actually empty, and I can uh, compare the file with what I have in the current workspace. What happens here is it opened a side-to-side -side editor in which I can see what do I have in my current workspace and what is in that commit. So I can do diffs, I can do comparisons between different files. Um, I can compare the file with a previous commit or with a history. There's so many things that we can do uh, that are not really relevant right now. Just want to show you at a glance what is this backup system able to do. I am now able to perform multiple backups, multiple progressive web backups, and I can inspect those backups and look at what I did during this commit or this other commit. I can compare the commits together. I can even revert to previous commits. Okay. Uh, we can do so many other things, but I think that the most important part, at least for the local point of view, is already done. We have an untracked file, we add it to the stage area, we commit the file, now we performed our backup, and that's it. We can also change history. We started using git log. We can also change 
a previously done commit with this commit amend in which we can change whatever we did with the commit. So the commit is not forever. I can still revert to uh, the previous commit, change the message of the commit, change the files of the commit, and then commit again. Or I can do other kinds of uh, resets, forcefully or not, gracefully or not. These look not really important at first, but they are actually really important because Git is really easy if you are doing things correctly. But whenever you mess up, there's no easy way to revert things back, unfortunately. Well, th at least in my experience. If you really, really know Git, you are very um, powerful with a command line or with graphical user interfaces. But usually when I mess up, it's because I mess up big and I have to look online. Oh my God, how do I revert this thing back? It happens lots of time, very often to me. I still cannot do everything perfectly from uh, fr from the beginning to end. In fact, there's an XKCD uh, thing about Git, um, a joke, very famous joke about Git. And yeah, it's this one. This is Git. It tracks collaborative work on projects through a beautiful distributed graph theory tree model. Cool, how do we use it? Oh, no idea. Just memorize these shell commands and type them to sync up. If you get errors, save your work elsewhere, delete the project and download a fresh copy. No, you shouldn't do this. But sometimes it's the only, it's the, yeah, it's probably the, the fastest way. If you mess up, just remove everything and you download the fresh copy from your uh, remote repository. You shouldn't do this, but it, if it works, why not? Okay, so uh, I'm not going too much in detail on how to revert things if you mess up. Uh, it's a whole world. Note that everything we've done so far is local. So we have a local backup with a local history of all the changes that we've performed so far. The problem is that if I want to switch to another computer, I don't have that repository on that computer. After installing Git history, I get a bit lost on how to display the history mode like you did. Okay, yeah, sure. I went really, really fast. What I did is Control shift p in order to open the command palette, or Command shift p if you're on Mac, and then I started typing git log, and uh, I see two possible commands. One is view history, git log in parentheses, or git set log level, which is something that I don't care about. I can now go up and down with my arrow keys and press enter on the command that I want, or I can go with my mouse hovering on one of the two and then clicking on it. I'm going to select with my arrow key the first one and then press enter. And this is what I come up with. Hope that it does for you too. Okay, while Angelo is, uh, is trying, I was saying that what we've done so far is a local backup. That, a very smart backup because we keep track of everything, not just the files, but who did what, why, with what message, and it's a smart backup because we can even revert to previous commits. We can uh, branch out what, something that we haven't done yet, but we can branch out, we can merge, we can do lots of things with Git, but everything is still local. What happens if I want to now continue working on another computer? I have to copy that .git folder from this computer to the other. Very inconvenient. What happens if my computer breaks? I lose my files and I lose my, all my history. I don't want to. I want a remote backup. I want to synchronize everything with a remote repository, okay? So, that's why we also have other commands which are called git remote, git fetch, git pull, git push. These are all commands that allow me to, first of all, select which remote repository will be the one that I'll be syncing with. Git fetch will uh, synchronize 
my remote repository with my local repository. It will check if there are any changes between what we have remotely and what we have locally. Why there should be any changes from local to remote? Well, maybe because I haven't sent those changes to the remote repository yet. Or because if you deal with remote repositories, then multiple people can work on the same project at the same time. They can have their own local repositories in which they do their own backups and they can synchronize all together to the same central remote repository. So yeah, it could happen that you're doing your work and then at a certain point someone puts some new changes in the remote repositories and you want those changes uh, locally too. So you fetch, you git fetch in order to see if there are any changes and then you pull in order to synchronize the remote changes to your local repository. And if you have some commits on your local repository that you want to send to the server, then you git push those changes to the remote repository. Angela says, after enabling the search bar, it doesn't show any results for git log. Don't know why. Okay, you probably need to reload the editor. I don't, I'm not sure. Uh, when I deactivated this plugin, this extension, I had to reload the editor. Maybe it's your case too, maybe not. Um, anyway, Control shift p once you've done, and you should do git log and you should find this, uh, this option here. Uh, if you don't, make sure that you install the correct one, git history, it should be installed and enabled. So enabled means you can only disable it. Uh, it should be this one. And if uh, it still doesn't work, try to reload the editor. That should make the trick. Hopes, hopefully. <laughs> okay, so we know how to add things to the staging area and we know to how, how to commit things in order to back them up, but it's still local. When you want to also um, save everything remotely, you need to know this other set of commands, which is push in order to push all the changes to the remote server, pull if there are any remote changes that you want to integrate in your local repository, fetch in order to just uh, check if there are any differences between what you have locally and what you have remotely, and git remote is actually one thing that you do just once in order to create this connection between your local repository and the remote repository. Okay, um, you know what? Before talking about branching, I would love to try and create something on GitHub. Let's see if we can do this in half an hour. So I would like you guys to go to github.com GitHub is the most famous website that allows you to freely store all your source code online. So it's a free remote repository for everybody. And it's widely used by everyone. Here you can find Facebook technologies, Amazon's technologies, Microsoft technologies, Google technologies, my technologies, <laughs> Everything that is open source is here. This is probably the successor of another website called SourceForge. SourceForge is now deprecated. We don't like it anymore. We love GitHub. GitHub was an independent website, but then it was recently bought by Microsoft. And we were scared about this because we know that Microsoft is always about the money, etc. No, it's not. Microsoft started making it even more open you can use GitHub in order to host your open source projects that are visible to everybody. And it had also a paid plan for a private repository. But now uh, Microsoft through GitHub allows you to have private repositories for free. So now it's even more open than before. And I would like, I would like to ask you guys to create an account on GitHub. GitHub is really, really important if you want to show your portfolio to anybody. In fact, I even have it listed on my CV. 
uh, on my CV, I have two GitHub repositories. One is my personal one, which I'm not updating anymore so far. And one is the Inglorious Coders repository in which I put all of my open source contributions, which sometimes means just exercises that I do, uh, just like this course. But still, recruiters don't know, cannot tell the difference. So they will see your contributions in the open source world. And this will be a big plus for you, even though you haven't really contributed to the open source world. You just shared your exercises, your experiments, your practice. But still, yeah, we've got the ability to push things on rep uh, this repository. I don't know what's happening with this website. It's quite strange to have this so small here. Uh, it, it, using, it, it using to be like that, but let me see here. Oh, still need to sign up to an account. Okay, so please guys, uh, create a GitHub account. And uh, once you're finished, probably it is better if we do another very delicate thing, which is to create an SSH key, whatever this means. GitHub SSH key. So GitHub will allow us to um, have repositories online and we can synchronize our local repositories with those remote repositories. The problem is that every time we want to interact with those remote repositories by pulling from remote or pushing to remote, we always need to, uh, to write our username and password because we have to authenticate. There are some ways in which we can skip the authentication part. One of them is to add another configuration on Git, which allows us to store the username and password so they are not required anymore. It will just store them somewhere and you will be able to just not use those uh, username and password. There is also another thing that you can do and it's to create this uh, key, which is uh, a very complex concept, but it's a private key that you keep private to yourself and you never let anyone see. And there's a public key that instead you share with GitHub. And through this uh, pair of keys, you get automatically authenticated to GitHub without the need of uh, inputting username and password. You know what? I think that this is probably too advanced right now. We can do it later on, once we are more confident with the terminal. For now, let's just skip this part and let's go with username and password. So, you create this account and then you're uh, already good to go. <coughs> now, when you have this uh, account, you have no repositories, you can create a repository and you can do it in two ways. You either create a local repository, just like we did a while ago, and you can uh, synchronize it with a remote repository that you have. Or you can create a remote repository uh, on GitHub and then clone it locally so you can uh, you are already um, attached, you are already synced between the local and remote. Um, I don't know if this is clear to you, probably not, but we start doing it and we will see what happens, okay? So on GitHub, I can create a new repository. Uh, this is kind of strange, this interface here, but what I want is to find this button here. It's a green button that says new because this is the list of all the repositories that I have. I'm gonna make it a little bigger. Oh, okay, now it works a better. These are the repositories that I have. There are a lot, even probably more than that. In fact, show more. Yeah, got lots more repositories. But there's a green button here that allows you to create a new repository. So I'm gonna click on this button. Uh, there are other places in which you probably can find this button. Uh, for example, here we've got a plus, and if I click on this plus, there's new repository. So there's always a way to create a new repository. 
you will find your way. I am clicking on this button. And now I'm on a page that allows me to create a new repository. Is anybody still struggling with creating an account on GitHub? Hopefully not. I haven't been hearing from you from a while, which hopefully it means that everything is okay. I hope I didn't lose you. Don't worry. No, Paul, good. Nice. Okay. <clears throat> so I can select a template for uh, this repository, but I don't want to. Uh, I can select the owner, and I am the owner of uh, four repositories right now, and I'm going to use Inglorious Coders. And I can specify the repository name. There is a suggestion here. Great repository names are short and memorable. Need inspiration? How about Upgraded Tribble? Well, no, this is a bad name. But still, as you can see, the convention used is kebab case. So all lowercase and the words are separated by dashes. This is the convention that we usually have in... Uh, GitHub repositories, because it's the convention of the web. It's the convention that we use in uh, URLs, in, a, in web addresses. So let's keep it like that. Um, you know what? I'm going to call it um, Inglorious Portfolio. And you can call it however you want. Uh, there is a check that checks if the name is already there. And uh, no, the name is available, so I can use it. Okay, but this is just an exercise of uh, using kebab case in order to create a, repo a meaningful repository name. We can add a description. Uh, the description will just be seen in the repository's uh, homepage. So, my first portfolio, something like that, whatever you want. The repository can be public or private, and by default, it Apparently it's private, but I want it to be public because I want to have a link, a, a, an address that I can then share with anyone. So I want the repository to be public so everybody will be able to see it. I can also initialize this repository with some uh, default files if I want. And uh, you know what? Yeah, let's do this. I'm going to click on this add a readme file. I'm going to choose a license and I want to use uh, one of the license provided here. Um, one of the most open and uh, yeah, and free licenses out there is probably the GNU General Public License 3, but I'll probably go with the MIT. Yeah, because GNU is actually restrictive in some sense because it doesn't allow you uh, allow people to copy your work. I want everybody to be free to copy my work. It's not going to be a good work, nonetheless, not for now. And I can also add another kind of file, which is this git ignore. The git ignore is a hidden file because it starts with a dot. And it's a text file in which I can specify which files and directories will not be used by Git. So you can synchronize and backup every file you want, except for the files that you specify there. Why is it important? Well, because sometimes you are putting in your project some files that are not really part of your code. Maybe they are external libraries and you don't want to put code that is not yours in the, in the project itself, in the repository. Uh, these libraries are always able to be downloaded later on. So you don't need to save them as a copy. You just save uh, the, the information that this project requires jQuery, requires Bootstrap, requires whatever you want. And then with a command, you will be able to download those libraries again. So you don't need to synchronize them. You don't need to back up those libraries. So yeah, usually the git ignore is uh, quite important. And there are some templates from which you can choose. And you know what? I'm going to use... Going to use... Is there a node somewhere? Yep, there is a node. So I'm going to use node. Okay. I'm going to use the template called Node. Jabatar says, this looks quite similar to the Netflix option we already used, which probably is the Netlify option. <laughs> I always mix them up. And you're probably right. 
Or was it Netflix? No. I haven't told I haven't talked about Netflix, so it must be Netlify. <laughs> yeah, but you're true. Yeah, that's true, that's true. Okay, so uh, let's recap. I I I press the green button, create a new repository. I'm not selecting any repository template, whatever this means. I chose a meaningful name. <laughs> ah, okay, yeah. Um, I chose a meaningful name. I wrote a description. I set the repository to public because I want this repository to be visible to the public. And I decided to add a readme file, to add a gitignore file with the template of node. And I wanted to choose a license, and I chose the MIT license, okay? This will set main as the default branch. Change the default name in Inglorious Coders settings. So as you can see, as I promised, it's not going to use master anymore, it's going to use main. So whenever you saw master so far, it will probably be replaced by the word main. But the concept is the same. It is the main branch, it's the default branch, it's the master branch, it's the, it's the trunk branch, or whatever other word you prefer. Just try to stick with the convention. So if now the convention is main, we are going to call it main. I will probably still continue calling it master because of uh, habits, but I will try to correct myself and call it main as much as I can. So, create repository! Yay! Here it is. This is the page, the web page that hosts my new repository. Ice on Fire created already one commit, an initial commit. And this initial commit contains already three files, which are the readme.md file, the license file, and the .gitignore file. What I see here is the contents of the readme.md file. And it has a title, and it has the description. This is the HTML representation of a Markdown document. MD stands for Markdown. And Markdown is a markup language, such as HTML, a very basic one, that allows me to write some text and the text will be automatically converted into HTML. There are some websites that allow for Markdown and many services use it now. For example, well, even uh, Slack allows for markdown. If I remember correctly, there should be some place here that allows you to really write markdown and it will just be formatted properly. Um, shortcuts? Nope. Okay, don't remember and don't care right, uh, right now. But whenever you use bold, italic, etc, etc, you are actually using markdown language, markdown syntax. So uh, this is a very basic web page in which I can explore these files. So I can click on license and I will go to this file, which is the MIT license. And I can go back one page and I can go to the gitignore file. And this is the contents of the gitignore file, which has a lot of things inside. These are usually folders and files that we don't want to synchronize on Git. So these are list files and folders that are listed, so Git will never back them up. They will never be staged inside of a commit, because we don't care. These are all about log files, which we don't want to synchronize with Git. Uh, some uh, data, some information about the process ID or something like that. Uh, some things about the test and the coverage. Directories that usually contain libraries and dependencies that, as I told you before, I still want to re-download them. I don't want to save them along with my source code. And so many other things that we don't really care about. So this is a, a pre-confectioned, pre-made gitignore that will probably work most of the times. And then I've got the readme.md file, which is the same content as the homepage that we saw before. It's just the title and the description. So, 
this is my the, this is my repository and now i want to clone this remote repository and have a local copy on my file system how do i do this i go to this green section here code and i can use one of these three tabs here i didn't know about this this seems this seems new and uh, I'm going to use HTTPS for now. So the, tab, the, the correct tab is HTTPS. And with this icon here, I can just copy the whole address of my repository. This is an address that I can already share with someone else. So they will be able to see the, the contents of my, co of my repository. Or I can just click on it, I copied it, and now from the terminal I can clone the repository. Cloning is something that happens only once. Cloning means that there is a remote repository, I want to make a local clone, a local copy, and from now on my local copy will be um, synchronized somehow, will be tightly coupled with my remote repository. So from now on I'll be able to push, to pull, to fetch, to do whatever I want and I don't need to clone anymore because the project was already cloned once. So where am I? I'm in my project. I'm going back one folder because I don't want to be in a repository. I want to be in a place where I can clone safely my repository. You can do this in your documents folder, you can do this in your desktop folder, wherever you want. I'm inside of a folder called Academy, and in this folder I have multiple files and folders. I want to clone my repository here. So I'm going to issue the command git clone, and then I'm going to paste right click paste the URL, the address of the remote repository that I just created. So git clone and the address, the HTTPS address. Remember, I am gonna show you again. You can clone in three different ways apparently. I'm going to use the first one, the HTTPS one, and I'm going to copy the whole address from here. <coughs> I'm going to paste it here, git clone, and then the address, and I'm going to hit, hit enter. Cloning into Inglorious Portfolio, blah blah blah, says a lot of things that I don't care about, but if I do another ls, I see that I have an Inglorious Portfolio. So the project is now cloned, and I can get inside of this Inglorious Portfolio, and see that there are the same files that I saw on the website. Well, all the files except one, the git ignore. Why is that? You're probably replying. Because the git ignore file is a special file with the leading dot in the name, which means that that file is hidden. In fact, I can see it only if I do ls-a. Oh, here it is. I see license and readme as before, but I also see my .git folder, which is the repository, and the .git ignore file, which is the file that tells git what, which files to ignore from the repository. So, we successfully cloned the repository from the web, from remote. And now we have a local repository where we can start working. So the last things that I'm going to tell you today are this. Um, of course, you can uh, open this folder on Visual Studio Code. But you know what? For now, I'm going to do this on the terminal and only on the terminal. I'm inside of the Inglorious Portfolio project, which is also a Git repository. I'm going to nano index HTML. Why, why that? Because I want to create a file and type something in it. So nano index HTML. Um, I should write all the index HTML tags here. I don't want to. I'm going to write just an h1 hello world. And nano is already starting to understand 
a little bit of the syntax. In fact, the H1 is uh, in Cyan. So I write whatever I want in the index HTML. You, really, you can just type A and that's fine. You don't need to type proper HTML for now. Just type anything you want. Is HTTPS something similar to HTML? Asks Angelo. Well, not really. <laughs> Um, they are they are two different protocols. We call it. They are sets of rules, languages. HTML means hypertext markup language. So it's a language, it's a markup language that allows you to create hypertexts. HTTP is called a protocol, and it's one of the most important protocols that are used on the internet nowadays. It's not the only one, but it's widely the, the, the most important one. And HTTP stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol. So yeah, there is some similarity with HTML because they start with hypertext, but hypertext markup language, HTML, allows you to define some, uh, uh, some uh, web document structure through the use of tags. HTTP is instead a protocol, so a set of rules that allow you to transfer that hypertext from a computer to the other. So they are related somehow, but one is the way you specify the hypertext and one is the way you transfer this hypertext somewhere. But this is HTTP. What is that trailing S? Well, this is the combination of HTTP plus another protocol called SSL, which is a security protocol that allows you to crypt all your messages and make them more secure. So HTTPS is the use of a protocol that allows you to send file, send a hypertext uh, anywhere in the web, plus the use of SSL, which allows you to secure this transfer. And this is HTTPS. We use it a lot. Everything is under HTTPS. This website is in HTTPS. Uh, very few websites still use HTTP. And when they do, the browser usually complains, hey, this website is not secure because it's using HTTP and not HTTPS. So make sure you're always using HTTPS. And we are using this kind of protocol to transfer the files, the source code, from the web to our computer and vice versa. So, okay, so we're writing this file. I'm gonna save it with Control O and press Enter. And I'm going to quit the editor with Control X. Now that I have a file, my local working directory is, has changed. It's not the same as the history of git states because the history of git doesn't know about it next html but my working directory does so what i'm going to do is to git add this file sorry what file were you modifying uh, nano previously the index html it wasn't uh, an existing file so i typed nano index html and this created the file and allowed me to to update its contents, okay? So, no previous file. I just typed nano index.html. I wrote whatever I wanted to write inside of it. Control O, enter to save. Control X to quit. Now that we have an extra file, if I do, I don't know, git status, there is a new file, according to git, that is untracked. So I want to commit it. So I'm going to git add the file in order to put this file to the staging area ready to be committed. Now the status says that there is a new file ready to be committed. Now I can git commit with or without the dash m. The dash m allows me to write the commit message in line. Otherwise I'm going to rely on the on the default editor that I have set. So git commit, and I'm gonna write add a file. We're gonna talk about the convention 
uh, on uh, use, on writing commit messages. But for now, I think we're good. So control O, enter, control X to exit. Now I have a commit and this new file is being backed up on my local repository. But it's local, it's not remote. So if I, if I look at my log, and I can use git log one line graph if I want to, maybe writing it correctly, I see that there is a new commit, add a file, but it's a local commit. Remotely, even if I refresh this browser, I don't see this file because the remote repository, which is not the same thing as the local repository, doesn't know anything about this last commit that I created. That's why I need to transfer this commit that I created remotely to the remote repository by pushing it. So I'm gonna do a git push and what I see here is that it asks me for a username and password. I hope it does too for you. And I'm pretty sure that it will not work for me because I even enabled two-factor authentication. So my username is ice on fire. My password, I don't even remember it. Let's try this one. Oops, no, probably I got it wrong. Ah, too complex of a password. No, it failed. I'm trying again with another password. Nope, still failing, at least for me. I hope it's not failing for you. But the reason why it's failing for me is because I'm really concerned about the security of my uh, GitHub account. So I enable two-factor authentication. And usually when I uh, perform pushes to the to, to the remote repository, I'm not using HTTPS as a protocol. I'm using this other protocol, which is called SSH, which is in fact a little more secure. And we will probably set it up one day. But uh, for now, I just don't care. You know what? I'm going to do a magic trick that will allow me to um, make it work on SSH. And don't worry if you don't understand what I'm doing. No problem with that. I'm just changing a URL. I'm pasting the other URL. And somehow this should make it work even without asking username and password. Let's see. Yep, it did. Git push and it's just pushing. Um, all good here and it shows up on the web now, the index HTML. Once I pushed, I can go back to the browser. I can refresh and I pushed the index HTML. So now it's in the remote repository. So for now, you already have um, some understanding on how this kind of backup system works, if we want to call it like that. You, every time you perform changes, if you have a properly set re uh, GitHub repository, you do three things mainly. You add the files to the staging area with git add and the files or just dot in my case. You commit the files so you are backing them up locally, creating a local backup. And finally, you push those files to the remote repository so everybody will be able to use them. And this is what we are going to do also next time with your current portfolio. So you will be able to share not only the results of your code, but also, well, the source code that you already have. Uh, I have to stop here because it's already late, but uh, we will continue later on. And don't worry, I know this was really abstract and probably tedious. As soon as we finish this part, we'll go back to HTML and CSS and we'll make everything look beautiful. A <laughs> real hacker right there. Okay, so as for the exercises, because I don't want to leave you without exercises, 
You can, well, create an account on GitHub. You did it already. Upload your portfolio as a rebel on GitHub. This is probably something that you still don't know how to do, unfortunately. Or you can try like this. You can create an empty repo on GitHub, as we did already. And you can set it as remote origin for your existing project with something that you don't know. Uh, let's do this. You can create your, uh, your repo on the browser, just like we did, you create a new repository. You can call it portfolio or whatever you want. You can clone the repository locally with git clone, just like we did. Then you can copy all the files that you created for your portfolio inside of this repository. And you can try git add, git commit, git push in order to have everything on, uh, on GitHub. So you will be able to share all your work by just doing this little trick. And uh, let me see what else. Did you just bypass the authentication of GitHub and push the file by changing the URL? I did not actually bypass the authentication. I bypassed the HTTPS authentication that requires username and password. But I set up already a different kind of authentication based on private and public key, which uses the SSH protocol. So by changing that URL, I'm leveraging another kind of authentication mechanism, which is even more secure than what I have uh, than the username and password one. And uh, so, yeah, it seems like I bypassed the authentication, but it's not. So another thing that you can do is, well, not really. Uh, there is a part of, uh, related to branching that I would like to show you and, uh, and teach you. Uh, if you want, you can just go to this website and try this game by yourselves. But I think it's better if we try it together next time. Um, in the meantime, since Git is really important and uh, quite difficult, I would like you guys to have a look at the reference. The reference is just the Git book, which is an online book made by Git that you can just read online. It's uh, really well done. It has plenty of cool images and pictures that allow you to understand it on a deeper level. Git is actually easy, especially if you have to perform the same three commands over and over. But it's really important to understand it on a deeper level as soon as you mess up things. Because believe me, you will mess up things as much as I do mess up things uh, even nowadays after many years of using Git. And uh, still, some of my students mess up big time with Git. In fact, I even used to have um, a Git channel on a, another on another Slack workspace that was all related to problems that you have with Git, because we will have problems with Git. But we just need to be extra careful, read carefully, write carefully, and be able to recover easily whenever we mess up. Please do practice, please mess up, please get back to me, tell me what you messed up, and we can fix these things together. And it's much better if we uh, incur into these problems today, well, or during the, re the rest of the week, before having to deal with these problems when dealing with more complex uh, situations such as JavaScript, for example. Okay, so far so good. Thanks a lot. I went a little uh, um, further uh, than the actual time, but we had so many technical issues, so I'm sorry if I robbed you a little bit. Awesome. Thanks for today's training. Thanks to you guys. It was a pleasure having you today, even, uh, even though we had so many problems, health and technical problems. See you next Saturday. We will continue Git. And as soon as we are over with Git, we will continue HTML, CSS, and we'll make our uh, website beautiful as much as we can. Okay? Cheers. It pasta could faster.